Is there an unseen realm behind the curtain of what we can see with our eyes? Is there a supernatural reality behind the one we know? I attempt to explain the unexplainable and get to know the unknown beyond the veil of this dimension from a Christian perspective. I'm Jerry, your host for Thai Girl for God Radio. Many dream of writing a screenplay that's adapted into a Hollywood movie, as well as being a successful best-selling author. My guest tonight has done both. His books paint a world in which history and characters come to life and are amplified in a powerful and evocative way, with brushstrokes of imagination, fantasy, action, and theology. Tiger for God presents through Paratruth Radio Network. Brian Kadawa and the Dragon King. Thank you for listening to the Thai Girl for God radio show on the Paratruth Radio Network. I have a very special guest tonight, and this is his second time on this show. And uh, please welcome Brian Kadawa. Well, Thanks for having me, Thai girl. <laughs> okay, great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Gadawa. I don't know your ethnic background, or else I would say, uh, you know, uh, whatever <laughs> your your ethnic background is, man. Uh, you know, plus man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, very. I, I'm actually Polish. Oh, you're Polish. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I, well, so we're so very just blessed say, to have Jankuya. Jankuya. Oh, you know, that sounds like Ukrainian. Um, my husband's Ukrainian, and uh, to say thank you is uh, Yakuyu. So I think yeah. there's some some close etymology of the language there. Hmm, yep. awesome. Well, uh, just to let you all know, if you don't already know already, uh, Brian Gadawa is uh, an, a Hollywood screenwriter as well as an author and researcher. Uh, he has a screen written uh, the movie To End All Wars with Keithers- Kiefer Sutherland. And um, that's about World War II. And then he also um, had uh, Mitten, Renny, Mitten written <laughs> many books. Uh, his latest series um, that he started um, is called The Dragon King. And that's what this interview will be based upon. And that starts his uh, Chronicles of the Watcher series. Um, and then the previous uh, series was Chronicles of the Nephilim. And that's uh, how many books, Brian? Eight eight books well he definitely is i think is in league with uh, some of the great uh author christian authors out there like uh uh jrr tolkien and c.s lewis i think oh i don't think so <laughs> <laughs> you sure about that you're being really humble <laughs> no no i definitely not <laughs> Oh, but thanks for the sentiment. Oh, well, I, I think so. But uh, a modern day C.S. Lewis, is, is that fair? <laughs> um, well, yeah, because quite honestly, I, I actually don't think C.S. Lewis was as great of an author. So, oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, I see. I see. So maybe it's <laughs> great of a writer. Com- oh, I see. <laughs> so maybe it's really, not such a compliment. Then. <laughs> yeah. No, he was really good with theology. Of course, he was brilliant. And, and uh, everything that it seems in my life, whenever I have some sort of uh, every season of my life, I have some new little different spiritual revelation. It seems like when I do, I find out C.S. Lewis had it and wrote about it way better than I ever could. Uh, but when it came to his fiction, I didn't like him as much as uh, Tolkien. But, oh, you know. I gotcha. Okay, that's understandable. Yes, he was a great theologian. And uh, I think that he wrote uh, something that was um, fairly theological but yet also kind of in a story uh format um that that is used in plays um the screw tape letters or what yeah, have you yeah i thought that was quite interesting well yeah. anyway uh brian um i know that you had written uh the dragon king and i read it and it was an excellent novel and i really liked it and i i did uh put an amazon review out there and and uh i had f- listened to the first half of it uh, and then, I'm sorry, pardon me, I read the first half of it, and, and just because I wanted to interview right away so that the ment- momentum is still going on for your book, I actually listened to you on audiobooks, the last half of it, and and both ways, the, the audio as well as reading it was awesome. I read it on my phone, believe it or not. <laughs> oh, cool. 
All right, Brian. Well, I know that you are a, a, a very good researcher, a, an excellent researcher, and uh, you, you and Charlie Wen who was the past visual director for Marvel Studios, um, that, that you and him had um, joined forces. And, and he gave you ideas for the skeleton of the story, and then you fleshed it out and you put the meat in. Would you say that would be a fair analysis? Well, we, you know, we developed it together. It's really 50-50, man, because... Okay. Um, you- yeah, he, he came to, we, we actually went to church together. We go to church together. And um, he read some of my Nephilim novels and he liked them. And so he came to me one day and just says, you know, hey, you know, let's, uh, you know, we were talking about some working on a project together because he wanted to, to develop his own stories as well. Um, and, and this was a time when he was working at Marvel Studios. He's no longer there, but he actually created the department for the visual development um at Marvel Studios. So he's the guy, he and his team are the ones who, who created the look of of all the characters on screen, at least, that you see, you know, what, whether it's Avengers, Captain America, Ant-Man, all those guys. Mm-hmm. He he had a hand in, in really creating the look of those movies, which is really phenomenal. So he came to me and, and said, you know, hey, you know, I've always been I've always been interested in um telling the story of the first emperor of China, because that's a little bit from his own heritage. He actually um, was, I, I think he was um, born, can't remember if he was, he wasn't born in China, but he has a Chinese background, you know, so I think uh-huh. he was born in Taiwan. He's born in Taiwan, that's it, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, but anyway, so, you know, he, and he said, that particularly because as a Christian, he said, you know, there's some interesting things about it that I think from a Christian perspective might be a really fascinating way of telling the story. And uh, one of those elements was the notion of the dragon. And we all know that the dragon is connected with China, right? But, mm-hmm. but the first emperor of China was the first, it was right around his time period. He was, he was around uh, 220 BC or so. And um, that was the time, before then they had used the dragon here and there for various emperors or gods or whatever. But it was at the time of the first emperor that it became a ubiquitous symbol for China and very much the positive symbol that it is today, right? And that, of course, is very interesting because from a Christian perspective, we see the dragon as obviously uh, uh, having a satanic or serpentine origin, right? Mm-hmm. And and he said at the same time, this was the emperor who also um, brought in the worship of the gods. At, at that time, before then, China had been a uh, a country, a, a continent of warring states for a thousand years. Five, or I think it was five different states that just warred with each other constantly, right? And so he brings in this unity and peace, but he also does something else because until this time period, the ancient Chinese people um, used to worship a single god, and they named him. They called him Shangdi. Mm-hmm. which would be similar to us saying God, you know, mm-hmm. and Shangdi, they worshiped him without images. Mm-hmm. Now, this is a very important thing because if you understand ancient history, you'll know that all ancient religions worshiped a pantheon of gods and they used images, you know, you know, like, you know, whether it's the statues or pictures or whatever, but the Chinese didn't. And the only other nation that did that, that worshipped a single God without images, was the Hebrew nation, the Jews. So there's some very interesting co- connection going on there. Yet the East had never had any connection with the West until like, you know, I don't know, like the 17th century. So like for a thousand years, thousands of years, they never even had context. So how did they get these similarities, right? Um, but I mean, we'll get into that in a second. But he said, the, the the emperor then, you know, Taoism was big at the time, Confucianism. They had what's called a, the hundred philosophies. You know, everyone was vying for control. and mm-hmm. uh, But Confucianism and Taoism were among the biggest. But he just sort of stamped, stamped them all out with his version of what's called legalism, uh, which is pretty much sort of uh, the belief of just a, a, a law. It's a very law oriented, which can be good, but it's law based on the will of the emperor. So, you know, it's very fascistic ultimately, Mm. but nevertheless, he brought in this worship of the pantheon of gods and eliminated the worship of the single God. Right. So again, there's a satanic connection going on there that we thought was interesting. And the Chinese people as well have admitted that he was a tyrant, even though Mm. he was the first one, even though he brought a lot of good, you know, he brought unity of language of peoples, uh, you know, Less war. Um, he he brought 
in the um, Unified Weights and Measures. And he was the guy that uh, basically built the Great Wall of China that we all know. Mm -hmm. And um, so he he brought in some good things, but as all tyrants do, of course, they're ultimately about the evil. Yes. <laughs> and 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 he had this this other side to him that he was searching for the elixir of immortality. He was looking for eternal life on earth. That's a fascinating concept. Again, a spiritual concept that we thought as Christians, we thought, wow, this is really fascinating. Let's look into this. Let's tell the story of this first emperor. Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, as we were working on and discovering, we, we started finding many fascinating, other fascinating connections to the Bible. Um, more, so much so that we realized we first started out wanting to write it as a screenplay and, and sell it in Hollywood because that's our, you know, that's our business, that's our world. But we realized that there were so many spirit, cool spiritual connections to the Bible that we knew that if we wrote, we wrote a script, um, I, have much ex I have much knowledge of many people people in the business who, you know, you, you get movies and if you have too Christian of a, a, of a spirituality to it, they'll cut it out, you know? Oh. And, um, so we thought, you know, we got to get our version out. So we'll still try to make it as a movie, but we want our version because it was so powerful. And then that's what made us, you know, decide to actually write it as a novel first. And so we developed the story together equally. Uh, it's probably one of my best stories be only because I think that having a partner you know, really brings a good challenge into your, you know, storytelling process that makes you a better storyteller. Uh -huh. Whereas when you're on your own, like I normally am, I do have people give me feedback, but um, I, I don't get as much of a challenge. So it was a very well-developed story. He's coming from that Marvel sort of perspective as well. And in fact, he drew some pictures that are on the website, you know. And um, so that was the, the, the genesis of it, you know, and there was more to it than that, too. If if wow. you want me to go into that, uh huh, sure, sure, go ahead, please. Well, so so I I didn't know the details about him, and I had seen some documentaries as we all have. This was also the first emperor. Was the, also his name was uh, for short. It was Huang Di. Mm -hmm. um, his full name was Qin Shi Huang Di, but uh, people can call him Wang Huang Di. But anyway, um, something else very fascinating though uh, that I learned from Chinese Christians was. I had actually read, I didn't know about this emperor. Oh, I got, I got off on a tangent and then went, okay. I <laughs> wanted to say this emperor was the guy who, who you've seen documentaries where he built all those terracotta warriors that they discovered underground, thousands of them. Uh -huh. uh, and he built them around his tomb in order to protect him in the afterlife. This was the wow. guy who did that. And, um, you know, as we did research, I discovered that, you know, his tomb is more than likely a ziggurat. At least it's in the same similar shape as a ziggurat. And for, for people who don't know, you know, ziggurats are those pyramids that are like step pyramids. You know, they're not flat like the pyramids at Giza, but they're actually step pyramids. And that ziggurat was the, the most universal ancient version of the cosmic mountain from ancient Sumer and all the way on. And it was you know, it was the temple of the gods. Wow. And at the top of the cosmic mountain, the top of the ziggurat, would ha they would have a temple where they would, you know, uh, communicate with the god. The gods would supposedly come down and communicate with them, right? Well, it so happens that the ziggurat is the same tower universally acknowledged by scholars as the Tower of Babel. And so wow. Christian, and this is where my research was, was I, I actually already read a book and it was called, uh, I, I can't remember what it's called, like the language of Genesis or something like that. And it's on, it's on the Gadawa.com website. I, I put down the books and all the, you know, scholarly research I, I found, but um, I found mm -hmm. out that the ancient language of Chinese, which is a pictor, it's a combination of pictorial and um, uh, not phonetic, but um sort of a pictorial and symbolic type of thing, you know, so it's intertwined, but it's uh -huh. basically a pictorial uh, language. And the ancient Chinese language shows evidence of the stories of Genesis within a, a lot of its words. For example, uh -huh. the word for tower has words like one voice, one tongue, um, people building with clay and bricks, it's very much sa the same as the story of the Tower of Babel. The word for boat is a ship with eight people in it. Mm -hmm. And that eight people, that matches Noah, right? Noah his, and his eight members of his family. I mean, eight total of the family of Noah, right? Uh, there's a word like tempter. The word tempter mm -hmm. includes 
two trees in a garden with a snake. <laughs> yes. Now, that's not particularly unusual because that, you know, there could always be influence across the, you know, across um, languages and across cultures. But this was thousands of years before the Chinese ever had contact with the West or with the ancient scriptures of mm -hmm. the Bible. So what Chinese Christians actually um, argue mm -hmm. uh, is that they came from the Tower of Babel, ultimately, when God spread the nations on the earth. Mm -hmm. And the Chinese came from the Tower of Babel, and they carried with them the same traditions. They all kind of knew Yahweh, but because mankind was you know, um, uh, sinful, they twisted the worship of Yahweh. But the Chinese people... It wasn't perfect, you know, their their religion, of course, but but it was closer to to that to that original worship of Yahweh, and so this is what Chinese Christians have been ar trying to argue to their own people who say, "Oh, Christianity is just a Western religion, so we don't have anything to do with it." They're like, "No, no, no, we come from the Tower of Babel, man. You know, we have the <laughs> same we have the same truths in Genesis embedded in our own la language." So this yes. is kind of the cool stuff that we were just, and believe me, there's lots more we discovered, but, but this is the cool stuff that we were real, discovering as we were trying to come up with a story, and we integrated it all within the story. Um, but the second major piece came together when we, want, we were working on the story of this of, in, in China. And, you know, this is like a cultural East meets West type of story. Mm -hmm. And we, but we wanted, you know, we were thinking of it as a movie at first, so we thought, you know, we really do have to have a Western perspective in this because you know Hollywood has to have that mm -hmm. and we're Western too you know right. um, so we thought well what was going on in this time in, in the Greek kingdom even though they didn't there what we didn't know of any connection between the East and the West maybe we could fictionalize a, a Greek warrior coming over and uh, we found out that this was the time where Mesopotamia was ruled over by the Seleucid kingdom it was the famous Greek uh, Antiochus the Great he was a Greek king, and he was he was like as big of an emperor in the West as the Chinese emperor was in the East. Mm -hmm. But his kingdom was getting uh, was starting to fall apart because he was too overextended. He also had under him the Jews, and in he he was reigning in Mesopotamia, just north of the city of Babylon. Now Babylon was kind of like modern day Detroit. You know, it was a once great <laughs> city. You know, it was once great city, but it's just. People are living there, but it's just a, a real, almost a wasteland. But they still had the temple that was possibly the Tower of Babel there. And they still had in there the Magi. And the Magi, we know about from the book of Daniel, right? When Daniel was taken uh, hostage with uh, the, the Jews over into Babylon, God placed him in, in authority over the wise men of Babylon. So basically, he taught them truths from the biblical scriptures that stayed with the Magi even until the first century because the Magi were guys who were came looking for Christ, right? They came looking for the Messiah. Uh -huh. So they're, they still had no, you know, they were also pagan, but they were kind of a mixture of all these things, right? So that was another fascinating thing. We thought, oh, interesting. So we came up with this idea. What if you know, we'll take our fictional character and place him into this historical story. So what we came up with was it's two, it's about 220 BC, mm -hmm. the ancient Western Empire is crumbling, and in a desperate bid to save his throne, the Greek king over Babylon sends his, his son, a dishonored warrior, into the mysterious land of the Far East to capture a mythical creature that will give him absolute power, a dragon. But what he soon discovers is a mad emperor who's seeking eternal life and, and immortality. Mm -hmm. And and so this was sort of the this is the essence of the story that we came up with. And that way we have a East meets West, and we get to show, you know, we get to delve into the differences between Eastern and Western viewpoints, because there are a lot of differences. And uh, you know, there's positive and negatives on both sides. Sure. But our our worldview as Christians was in the clash of kingdoms, there's always a higher kingdom that is superior to all. And that, of course, is the kingdom of God. And so um, we weave that in, in in a much more subtle way than I did in my previous novels. Um, so this novel, The Dragon King, um, can have, you know, I, I, I sometimes pitch it to people as Raiders of the Lost Ark in China. <laughs> you know? 
Sure, sure. So, well, I what I loved about the book was that I could totally envision every scene in my mind's eye as if it was a movie, and I thought, oh, I would love to see this on the the silver screen, and I just I'm hoping and praying that you know it eventually does get adapted into a movie. That would be awesome, and I really liked. Th- how it there's something for everybody there's there's uh historical fiction and action and uh a little bit of romance and some a comic relief with the three magi <laughs> and yeah <laughs> and i really i really liked it a lot um and and I, when i saw the uh graphic depictions of antiochus and um the concubine i forget her name and and uh the dragon and the dragon king i thought oh this this is exactly you know or this is very similar to what i envisioned them in my mind's eye (laughs) oh that's great and well i know that some people say it's it's well i know it's historical fantasy however um i do believe that there's there's more history than fantasy because um i believe and i've read and i've researched um a little bit that um dragons uh were something real that the ancient people as well as modern people as they found um dragon bones or dinosaur bones with actual dna and and well and with actual blood in them and that doesn't happen unless they're fairly young compared to you know um some of the other theories out there so do you think that that uh like for example in the book of job how it talks about the leviathan which could be a dragon slash dinosaur and then also all these you know uh, beautiful artwork of uh, these different sea dragons, and and uh, also the depictions of the West. We, you know, with with the dragons breathing fire. Do you think that they actually saw dragons? Well, that is definitely debated. Um, you know, you know, I there's a there's a great book called the the uh, First Fossil Hunters by Adrian Mayer, the First Fossil Hunters, and that's a book that actually does make the argument that. Much of what we uh, read about in ancient, um, you know, ancient historical documents, you know, ancient historians have written um, about dragons or about discovering monsters and such. Mm-hmm. Um, she makes the argument that a lot of that can be, uh, and giants even sometimes, uh, a lot of that can be uh, um taken down to the fact that they discovered dinosaur bones, but they didn't know what they were. So they call them dragons, right? And so I, I do bring a little bit of that into there. Mm-hmm. Um, but those were dinosaur bones. Uh, whether or not they're dinosaurs living at that time, I, I, there's no evidence that I'm, from, that I'm that I know of. But, mm-hmm. but uh, yeah, so there is some connection there, in, at least in terms of ancient history. Um, but there's another element that I tried to, um, that I tried to bring out. And, you know, you mentioned Leviathan, for instance, and one of the things that we do in this novel is we, we write what I call supernatural history. Mm-hmm. Uh, you could call it a bit of a fantasy, but basically we use the fantasy genre in order to communicate spiritual reality. So I actually have um, a, a sea dragon of chaos, let me put, uh, uh, that's all I'll say, that, show up, that shows up in the book that was also in my Chronicles of the Nephilim, as a matter of fact. And you know he represents the nature of chaos and such. And, and it all has to do with spiritual meaning and, and all. But, mm-hmm. but we do use some of these fantastic elements to bring the spiritual reality. And we also have some watchers that show up um, as territorial spirits of the nations. So we do show some of that in there as well. But the thing about dragons, um, there's, you know, in the, this is one of the differences between East and West. Because in the West, we've, our, our, our view of dragons is like dy- basically like big reptilian dinosaurs with, uh, who breathe fire, right? Mm-hmm. But in the East, their, their view of dragons, you know, if you look at their arts and stuff, it's really more like a large snake with little, little feet. <laughs> and, and they're more connected to water, not fire. So it's kind of fascinating how you see the different, connect, you know, the differences, and yet they're still rooted in a similarity of the serpentine, right? And where's, where does that come from, right? Uh-huh. So that's what, I, you know, I try, to, I try to work all that in there. Whether, whether or not there's actual dinosaurs at that time, uh, I leave that to other writers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I uh, saw a beautiful video that uh, that you saw too, and you liked it, uh, which was the uh, etymology of, of the the Chinese language that was uh, rooted from 
the Genesis biblical accounts and such. And and I, I do remember that in, in uh, your past interviews uh, regarding the Dragon King that you had talked about how amazingly uh, the Chinese word for boat has eight little mouths or eight mouths. And yeah. of course, that, that parallels the story of Noah and his wife and children. Um, and then uh, the tempter, and I think I saw that on the, the video that, that we both liked, which was, um, I, I know you said it too, the, the tree, the snake, and I think, yeah. I think also the woman as well. And it was just, I saw this other, um, so not only that video, but I also saw this one um, teacher in Singapore, this pastor in Singapore, he had talked about for a whole hour, dozens and dozens and dozens of of Chinese characters that, that paralleled uh, the the Genesis account. So, and that totally makes sense considering that, that, uh, that we all, you know, not we, but I mean, you know, our, our forefathers and foremothers, you know, from, you know, centuries ago, thousands of years ago, you know, had, had come from, uh, the tower of Babel, that would make sense. And the same pastor uh, from Singapore said that, um, in five BC, um, Buddhism and Confucianism started, but what was their religion? What was the Chinese religion? Who did they worship from 2500 BC to 5 BC? And yeah. um, and then he said it was Shangdi. And he also said that Confucius uh, talked about Shangdi, the the very nature of God, uh, in that parallels y- Yahweh, uh, Jehovah in the Old Testament uh, that yes. the, that the Hebrews worshipped, um, and, and I just thought that was really interesting. That that uh, you know many people, you know, self included, never thought that Asians uh, had any connection or tie with uh, Judeo Christianity. So I just thought that was so awesome, and uh, a little bit with the. Thai people, I, I've always wondered, you know, since I was raised in California with mainly Caucasian people, I always wondered, okay, where where did we come from? I know that we kind of look Chinese, sort of, but we kind of look a little <laughs> East Indian, you know, what yeah. am I? Who am I? Am I animal, vegetable, or mineral, you know? <laughs> um, so I, I, I just Wikipedia, you know, what, who the Thai people were after, you know, uh, 38 years, and and I, I read, I, I know Wikipedia is not, you know, the greatest resource in the world, but, but it is, you know, okay, it's good, you know, and yeah. It, it said that um, that the Thais uh, originated from China, and my my maiden last name is Kawi Wong, or the Thais say Kawi Wong. Uh, but you know, when I came to you know we kid California, or m- when my you know was raised in California, I didn't want to you know be so you know Asian, you know, because it wasn't cool to be Asian in the early '80s after the Vietnam War. Yeah. So <laughs> I said, oh, I'm I'm uh, Jerry Kawi Wong, you know, I really Americanized yeah. it, but it's really, you know, there's Wong in that, you know, so I joke and say, I'm always the Wong woman and never the white woman, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, a corny joke time. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> Wikipedia said that the ties originated in China um, about 200 BC. And I, I guess that the ties, uh, you know, kind of were their own people within China. And, and the Chinese actually called uh, the ties uh, a, a Chinese word for foreign servant, believe it or not. So, oh. <laughs> so apparently we were a little different, you know, different Chinese type of people. But then, you know, I, I don't know if there was any persecution from the Chinese to the ties, but they you know, my uh, four mothers and four fathers, you know, who were in China, they, they fled and they went to the Southeast Asia and, and they, uh, there are a lot of their culture, their food, their names is a, co- a combination of Chinese and a little bit of India influence. Like I would say, um, you know, uh, Buddhism, you know, Buddha was uh, East Indian and then also uh you know the Cambodian and Indic peoples I guess so it's we're mm-hmm. our skin color our names our food uh the the main religion in, in uh, Southeast Asia is, is basically Buddhism which is kind of an offshoot of of you know what uh the Hindu you know religion and I think Buddha is one of their you know gods that they worship you know but even though I'm not you know a Buddhist um but you know I, I kind of wanted to see you know where uh, what kind of you know connection I had you know with China um so i just thought that was kind of interesting <laughs> well you know china has a far reaching influence because um i believe also the most ancient civilizations in south america uh of which the indians down there have come out of also uh like the olmecs and stuff they they also believe that they they may have chinese origins as well so it's kind of interesting how they've spread out around the earth 
Wow, very, very yeah. interesting. Well, Brian, what would you say would be, um, well, actually, I could just come out and ask, uh, what, uh, so what is your most recent book? My most recent book is, uh, other than The Dragon King, um, would be, I have another one that I just released, um, which is a, a, a book of my essays, um, and it's called God Against the Gods. And what it is, is it's a book, um, it's a book that has my essays where I try to explain to people how God captures the imagination and how he does that through many different ways, one of which is actually um, um, appropriating pagan imagination and retooling it, investing it with new meaning and sort of taking it over basically and giving it new meaning to glorify him. Uh, now this would be something that would make some Christians quite scared and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, what are you saying? So for, let me give some examples. You know, um, I write about all different examples in the old Testament, the new Testament, um, and how it, God uses imagination in the Bible. And so there's a lot of examples where God will take imagery that, that pagans use of their gods and use it of himself. Mm-hmm. Now, let me give you an example. For instance, Baal. Baal was the god of the the most high god of Canaan when the Jews were coming in to take the promised land that God promised them, right? And so they were going to take it away from him. They had just come from this dry desert world of of Egypt, where um, um, you know their life comes from the river, the Nile, right? And uh, it's a completely different environment, and they're coming into this land of forests and and trees and foliage and fruit and all this kind of stuff and rain from heaven, which is very unusual, right? And so you see in the biblical text, you see God actually using rain and water language and storm language of himself once they're coming to, into that that promised land, uh, which is very similar to the storm language used of the storm god Baal. There are phrases that the ancient pagans used of Baal. For instance, they called him the cloud rider or rider on the clouds. And that was an expression of his you know, um, omnipotence and, and deity, uh, but it also was a form of judgment upon nations or cities. Well, guess what? In the Bible, God calls himself the cloud rider or rider on the clouds when he comes in judgment. Um, there's There are passages in, in the Bible, like uh, Psalm 29, for instance, that it, almost the entire Psalm uses very common language that is very common with the Canaanite Hebrew language of their poetry. And so there's the, the, these many examples where God's drawing from them. And of course, you've got the liberal theologians then say, ah, see, uh, you know, the Jews just mm-hmm. copied other religions and changed it. You know, it's the same thing. No, that's not actually the case. There's another way of understanding it, and that is God is using other people's culture polemically, which means he's using their imagination and their culture and giving it new meaning so that he will be glorified. And and so it's like he's saying, Baal isn't God, Yahweh is God. That's why he's using the storm language. That's why he's using, you know, rider on the clouds. He's telling the Canaanites, he's telling even the Jews, Baal isn't the, the storm god most high, Yahweh is. So it's really more of a polemical thing against against the gods rather than uh, being, you know, what many liberals say now, which is, uh, you know, it's it's evolved, you know, um, Judaism is evolved out of paganism or evolved out of pantheism, or I'm not, sorry, not pantheism, polytheism, right? Mm-hmm. And that's just, I don't think that that's the, the necessarily the way to understand it properly. So that's kind of what I write about, but I, you know, mm-hmm. I want to come at it from a perspective that, that you can learn a lot about beauty and truth when you study the imagination of the Bible. So I explain things like Leviathan. What is Leviathan? There are many Christians who think Leviathan is a dinosaur. I don't think it is. I've studied it extensively in the Bible and outside the Bible because all the ancient religions had basically a a Leviathan, and it's a sea dragon of chaos. And so God actually uses that sea dragon of chaos as a symbol when he's describing how he establishes his covenanted nation Israel. You know, it's like when he establishes his supreme order, his kingdom on the earth, it's like he is crushing the heads of Leviathan. He's pushing back the sea. He's drinking up the waters. This is all language 
image that is used of that other pagan gods use, but they use it of Yahweh because they're basically saying our God is the God who who pushed back the chaos and established his holy covenanted order. If that's if that makes any sense, and so the sea dragon of chaos is that symbol that they refer to. That's just one of many examples throughout the Bible, um, and it's so. In other words, a lot of Christians are afraid of this notion of myth and mythology, and they think that oh, you you can't say that because then you're saying the Bible's myth. Nothing of the nothing of the sort. I mean, everyone uses symbolic language. Everyone uses creative, imaginative language even the writers of the Bible. So they use symbols in their talk just like we do, you know? Like we might say, you know, um, whatever, uh, uh, you know, he, it, 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 blew, it, it blew me away. <laughs> you know what uh, I mean? We uh-huh. use all this language that's very creative and imaginative to help us communicate something. Well, they did too as well. And the more that you can study it and learn, and here's the key. Here's the key of the whole, Bible, of the whole book. The more we can seek to understand the Bible, Old and New Testaments, within its original ancient Near Eastern context, not our own modern one, that's the more we can begin to understand more depths of God and and his word that are not apparent to us through our Western eyes. We have to seek to, to study about that ancient world and find out what did these things mean to them in their world, not our world. See, so when we see Leviathan, we go, oh, it must be a sea monster, must be a a dinosaur or something like that. And it's like, no, no, understand within their context. And then you can understand God with a much more imaginative eye. Mm -hmm. Amen. Well, hold that thought. We're just going to take a quick break for Jerry's Food for Thought. Now it's time for Jerry's Food for Thought. This dragon or dinosaur factoid is from Ken Ham from his ministry Answers in Genesis. Dragons are memorialized in legends, historical accounts, and artwork from around the world. To name a few, there's an aboriginal depiction of a water monster that resembles a pleosaur, an ancient historical account of serpents in Egypt with bat-like wings, the epic poem Beowulf with its account of a fiery flying serpent and Native American petroglyphs that are etchings in stone that resemble dragons. Dragons are depicted on flags, emblems, tapestries, maps, pottery, pictographs, and more. Although from disconnected cultures, the descriptions are remarkably similar. The next dinosaur or dragon factoid comes from Paul G. Humber, who was the founder of CR Ministries. Some scientists searching through the land of China and finding dinosaur bones have heard from the local people who live in the villages that for many years these people have them digging up dinosaur bones and boiling them in soup, believe it or not. The bones are rich in calcium and are quite suitable to add to the soup. This was Jerry's Food for Thought. Okay, we're back with uh, my special guest, Brian Godawa, and uh, we'll just go ahead and continue uh, with uh, talking about his his book series. Brian, could you tell me about uh, what the Chronicles of the Watchers is about, as well as what the Chronicles of the Nephilim are about? Yeah, you know, the Chronicles of the Watchers, it's going to be probably a trilogy, um, but um, it, it was it was originally rooted in a concept that I discovered um, and based my previous series on, Chronicles of the Nephilim. <clears throat> and what that is is what I call the Watcher paradigm. And what that means is that in the book of Deuteronomy, thir- chapter 32, God talks about how when at the Tower of Babel, when he s- separated the peoples and right and separated the nations, the notion of the Tower of Babel, you're, you know, where he, uh, everyone spoke his one tongue and then God and they were because they were trying to um, – you know, uh, because they were deifying themselves and worshiping other gods, God split them out upon the face of the earth, gave them different languages, right? And that's where the Bible notion of the different nations comes from. Well, what it says in Deuteronomy 32 is that when God did that, he think about this. He just destroyed the, the, the whole earth with water, all, you know, and eight people survived for man's evil. Then man starts all over again. And within a short time, you know, who knows, several hundred years, they're, they're building the Tower of Babel, trying to reach the gods again. Mm-hmm. So man becomes so evil right, right away again that God says, okay, look, if you're going to continue to be this way, 
then I'm going to give you over to your gods. And so in Deuteronomy 32 says that he gave them over and he allotted the Gentile nations under the authority of the sons of God. Mm -hmm. Who are the sons of God? The sons of God are ultimately watchers. They are watchers over the nations. Because in the ancient world, in the ancient Bible, as well as in other ancient religions, they understood that <clears throat> behind the, the authorities on earth, you know, the kingly authorities and such, behind those authorities, there were spiritual authorities, which is where you get this notion of the spiritual warfare in heaven, you know, that we read about in Daniel, right? Where Daniel talks about how the prince of Persia is fighting with the prince of Greece, and, and that was basically a spiritual uh, spiritual princes that was not you know earthly princes, mm -hmm. but at the same time that the the earthly kingdoms were were in conflict as well. So they had this notion that the earthly and the heavenly worlds are united in that in that way. Well, God says in Deuteronomy that he, what he did was it was like saying, look, if you're going to keep worshiping these false gods, well, I'm going to take these fallen angels that have come to earth, in, you know, before the flood, mm -hmm. and the Bible says that before the flood, the sons of God, some of them, not all of them, but they came down from God's throne. They, they rebelled against God. They came down from his throne. They came to the earth and they mated with women, human women, mm -hmm. and they bore them the Nephilim or the giants, which were hybrid angelic human hybrids, which is, I know this is weird and freaky, but I'm convinced that the Bible basically communicates this, this story. Mm -hmm. And it's not just a freakish thing. It's actually a storyline that goes throughout the whole Bible. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so he destroys the flood with the world with the flood, and then you know after the Tower of Babel he separates the nations and he places the Gentile nations under these these fallen sons of God, which are called Watchers. But then he says, "But I will keep Jacob for myself," and 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 so God basically says, "In the future I will choose the land of Canaan out of all these territories that other gods are are an authority over. I'm going to take this territory and I'm going to be the God over Israel." See, mm -hmm. and so that's the notion that he that he sets up at the Tower of Babel, goes throughout the whole Bible, even unto the unto the New, New Testament, where Jesus as Messiah comes in, and we read about Paul saying, "What we fight not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of spiritual darkness in the heavenly places," and that's this notion that these, you know, he's saying, "Look, these um, earthly authority, <clears throat> excuse me, these earthly authorities that are persecuting you." They're not really the ultimate bad guys. The ultimate bad guys are the spiritual authorities behind them because they still believe that the, they had these uh, territorial powers behind the earthly powers. Now, when Messiah comes, uh, you know, he's the one that takes back the land deeds, so to speak, right? He, he takes back the inheritance or the allotment is the word that the Bible uses a lot. Um, he takes back the allotment of all the lands and, and, and that's where the gospel comes in, right? Because when it says before the gospel, it was one land, Israel, one people of God. But now people from every Gentile nation can now come to God. Why? Because Messiah has taken away the authority of those sons of God over those nations. And they're under his authority now. And so that's why we see the gospel going out and people from every tribe and every nation are now flowing into the kingdom of God as they become Christians, right? That's the sort of, you know, maybe big picture storyline of, of what's called Christus Victor or uh, the victory of Christ over the powers. Mm -hmm. And that's the big story that I thought, you know what? That was so fascinating to me when I discovered it. There's many, uh, there's many, many layers in the Bible. Uh, we've got the atonement. We've got sacrifice. All that stuff is relevant as well, but there's so many layers in the Bible. And that was the layer that I recently discovered, which really led me to write the Chronicles of the Nephilim, because in that in that series, I wrote about everywhere I, I decided I wanted to retell every Bible story where giants or, or and watchers appear together or mm -hmm. are separated. And so that's why it's got eight novels, and I go throughout the whole Bible, and I'm, I'm retelling those stories where giants appear. Because the giants are not just some arbitrary freak, freakish occurrence. They're related to these watchers. They're related to the seed of the serpent. And they're part of the storyline of this, of what's going on. But once that series was done, um, when we were researching the Dragon King, we suddenly realized, wow, this could be a story that can continue that same watcher paradigm, even though we're in another, we're, you know, we're, we're outside the biblical land, we're over in another land of China. But really, if there were watcher gods over all the nations, there would be a watcher god over China, right? Or a watcher, um, you know, uh, spirit, angelic being, whatever word you want to use. But mm -hmm. um, 
so that was the that's what made us go well let's write this series let's make this a series where we're kind of telling stories about other worlds where there are still watcher gods over these other nations Mm -hmm. and where does that all come from and so in the future we might do a story we might tell the story of daniel you know where we read about these these the prince of persia and the prince of greece at battle and all this kind of stuff Mm -hmm. so um you know we're gonna extend it from there but that was the principle of Chronicles of the Watchers, this notion that the gods are at war and they are they are authorities over the nation. So mm. that that was sort of the premise of that. Amazing. That's interesting. You know, when, when I had listened to your past interviews, that scripture I had, uh, that I feel the Lord had brought to my mind um, with regards to how um, how people like if they don't worship the true God, that God actually causes a, a delusion you know for them to believe if, if they in other words if they won't worship the true god then they'll be deluded to following you know these these watchers or these false gods yeah. or or idolizing them and, and it almost doesn't seem fair but i know god is a fair and just god and 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 basically it you know it goes back to that scripture you know choose you this day, you know, whom you will serve, whether it's, you know, the true God or Baal or, or, you know, one of these, you know, lesser gods or whatever. And and just like you said, you know, it, you know, some Christians might say, well, well, wait a minute, you know, you know, we, we shouldn't talk about the, these lesser gods, you know, that are actually demons and and what have you. And, and yes, we're not to glorify them or worship or idolize them, but it was a, a reality in the Old Testament. It's a reality in the New Testament. And even in modern days that, that not only are, they're, you know, watchers still, you know, that, that are over the nations because, you know, the, the people decided to refuse God. Um, but that, you know, I believe that, that, uh, just like, you know, you had illustrated in your novel that, um, that it's just not like a spiritual reality. Like a lot of people, especially the, the Western mindset, um, you know, they tend to, you know, disbelieve you know the spiritual realm because they can't yeah. see here or feel it yeah and um but yet you know the bible does definitely talk about a spiritual realm containing you know uh fallen angels uh which yeah. are demons um these these watchers and then also uh you know physical beings you know and and even though you know a lot of people don't see you know giants you know uh walking around you know um uh, you know traumatizing tormenting people or whatever i believe that the um you know that satan has another sort of agenda you know to to mix you know his you know uh seed with the seed of of men you know to corrupt you know um beings genetically but that's a different subject altogether <laughs> <laughs> so tell me more about shang di um just real quick i uh that same Sing- singaporean pastor uh who talked about how 2500 years before christ that they basically worshiped God, Shang Di, you know, um, that was the same God as the Hebrews. Um, and it is interesting because I always thought that um, Confucius and um, Lao Tzu, I thought, you know, many people think, you know, that they're, they, they're Buddhist, but they, they talked about a personal God, a monotheistic personal God who loves people. And uh, so could you tell, tell us more about Shang Di? Yeah, well, you know, and, and by the way, this doesn't mean I wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest that therefore people, like Confucius and stuff, uh, you know, whatever, were saved or or were were uh, children of God in that sense. Because I think that that what it what it shows is is that in the same all all men over over the earth, all men and women over the earth, uh, Roman the Book of Romans says that that we all know God, right? We and because God has put in Himself in creation around us, and He placed within our hearts. The knowledge of God, but man suppresses the truth in unrighteousness. And so every religion has a glimmer of truth, right? It's just a twisted, distorted truth. And the same is true, I would argue, for for China. Um, but it's interesting that they kept, in some ways, uh, they were less corrupted in some areas than other religions were. And that's what I find fascinating about this. And it does show me that, again, even cultures unconnected with the West still have this innate knowledge of the living God. And they do twist it and distort it as well, but it shows up. It comes out like you, like you said, with the Confucius sayings, you know, there are other ways in which it comes out as well. Um, For instance, uh, Shangdi 
uh, when they worshiped Shangdi, basically each of the kings of the kingdom would once a year, they had uh, an altar that they called the altar of heaven and earth. And they're, they're, the famous one we now know is in Beijing, and that's the biggest one. And that was the main, the main altar. But of course, now what it's become is like a tourist trap and all that but what it was this huge open area with a tri-level platform on it where once a year the king or the emperor would go in and sacrifice an unblemished animal for the sins of the people now this again is reflective of biblical truths um and that was called the border sacrifice so that again these are elements that reflect connections spiritually with the Bible, even though they had no real connection. Um, another, another thing I found um, in our research was that there actually may have been a connection between Babylon and China mm-hmm. in, in around 400 BC or so during the days of King Cyrus. Because if you remember your Bible, um, Cyrus of Persia basically conquered Babylon after Daniel was gone. Uh, Cyrus of Medo-Persia conquered Babylon, then he allowed the Jews to go back into their land and rebuild their temple and, and, and such. And, um, but there have been discovered in China oracle bones, which are bones in which they, they write their lang- you know, they write things on the bones, you know. And in those, on those oracle bones, they found references to Cyrus of Babylon. <laughs> oh, wow. So actually there may have been some, some kind of trading connection or something between Cyrus of Babylon and China. N- another fascinating possible connection there that, um, you know, the history that is hidden in history, so to speak. Um, but yeah, so all these different connections between East and West and, and um, another element is um, this ancient pantheon of the lesser gods. It's interesting because that is very similar to the notion of God's heavenly host in the Bible. They're called the sons of God. They're divine beings who surround God's throne. Uh, but in the Bible, of course, we aren't to worship them. They worship Yahweh, the living God. But in China, it's, it's very much similar. There's a pantheon of these lesser gods that surround Shangdi and serve Shangdi. So uh, there's another commonality between the biblical understanding and the ancient Chinese understanding. But again, it gets corrupted by, uh, by the time of Huangdi, and the lesser Shangdi gets suppressed, and the lesser gods become the ruling sort of deities in, in, the, in the mindset and the worldview of China. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, I don't want to spill all the beans of the book. So the, drag, <laughs> the Dragon King ha- tries to explore these differences and similarities and and uh, in, a, in a very interesting uh, multicultural way. Now, I know that according to the Bible, the dragon is viewed as, as Satan himself. Mm-hmm. A- and do you think that there was some sort of like a spiritual conversion, you know, from, from you know, uh, good to evil, darkness to light, from, you know, uh, the worship of the true God to these false gods and everything with, with the emergence of the dragon king? Do you think sort of a spiritual conversion that took place? I do. I do think to some degree there, it definitely was. And because we found these connections and, you know, um, I think it's, it's certainly representative of what goes on. And again, this is represented all over the the world. And Romans one talks about this when it says that they knew God, but they, they knew God, but they suppressed the truth and unrighteousness and they worshiped creation instead of the creator and they neither glorified God nor honored him. And that's the, I think that's the story of all mankind, and that's the story of Babel. And that's why I think this whole link between Babel and, and you know, the, the Gentile nations on the earth is, is such a fascinating one. And, and, and we try to bring that, that Babylon-Babel connection in, into the Dragon King in a very fascinating way and entertaining way as well. When I read about... Um... Marduk and and how you described Marduk was really really trippy and and uh, thought that was interesting um how um you had stated that he was a shining one. And it's interesting that uh, when I interviewed Gary Wayne, he talked about um, some some hybrid beings that were Nephilim that were called the shining ones. And, and he the way he characterized them, um, as well as the way you characterize them, parallel each other. Um, so I know that that you mentioned that scripture yeah. that that the that the gods that people think that they're worshiping are not 
gods at all, but they're demons. Um, do you think that that they are like physical, like you know, Nephilim creatures that that are that are eating these, you know, like the sacrifices? Well, you know, I okay, th- that's that's a complicated subject, but um, basically, here's how I see it. Based on my study in the scriptures, I I do not I think that angels. Um, and and f- which include fallen angels and non-fallen angels, or or shall we say, um, sons of God and angels, are not the same thing as spirit spirits. And what I mean by that is, angels have some kind of material body. It's not the same as humans, of course, because it can go through different dimensions, right? But it does have a physicality to it. Why? Because everywhere in the Bible you see angels. They have physical presence. They can eat, right? They can, right. Have, they can have sex with women. Right. So there's a physicality to them. So it's not the same as technically a fallen angel is not a demon. A demon is actually, by the way, and, and watchers and sons of God are not Nephilim. Nephilim are the progeny of the watchers having or mating with humans. Right. And uh-huh. Nephilim then are, are giants, but they're, they are fleshly humanoid creatures on earth. They're not like the angelic beings because, but they are hybrid. Um, and so when they die, the, the notion in the Bible is uh, that, that, and the book of Enoch is that the spirits, the demons that we know of today are in disembodied spirits. They're uh-huh. not, angels are not disembodied spirits. They are embodied, but demons are not. They are the, the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim seeking bodily habitation. So that's kind of where I, I see there's, there's a difference, uh, kind of a hierarchy of the way everything uh-huh. operates, you know? Um, but that's, that's what I've, what I've concluded in, in my study. So therefore, um, oh, but but the the description of cherubim and seraphim and all that stuff it does it always includes this shining like bronze and even Jesus in heaven in the book of Revelation is described as shining like bronze. So I do think that heavenly divine beings shine, whether they're good or evil, they shine. You know, there's right. a shiningness to them, mm-hmm. and uh, that's why I included it in, in in mine, and that's why they do it does show up. You know, but like I say, a a good, a fallen angel or a good angel can both shine. So it's, you know, right. you, you can't know them except through what they're saying and whether or not it says to follow Yahweh or not, you know? Uh huh. I know that in um, a lot of, you know, pagan idolatrous religions, you know, that they, they'll put out an offering, not necessarily like, you know, uh, a goat or a sheep, you know, but like in Buddhism, for example, you know, they'll, they'll put um, incense in front of, mm-hmm. you know, the statue and, and then, um, then they'll put like a, a, a cup of tea and, and some, you know, some yeah. food, food and, you know, like sometimes cigarettes or, you know, <laughs> like these, these different things that, that they, they feel that, you know, uh, or whether it's Buddhism or ancestral worship or a- animist worship, where they're worshiping a god of water or god of the land yeah. or, or trees, or whatever, they'll always put out like a green thing, like a vegetation or some type of offering, and they feel like the spirit behind it will, quote unquote, consume it, you know, or something, you yeah. know, to show that, you know, and and I when when you said that Marduk, uh, which is the uh, the paganistic god of the the Babylonians, you know, like yeah. like had consumed, you know, yeah. th- their offering. I thought, okay, was, is he saying that that's that's a physical thing that he he crunched and munched on this goat? Or, or well, what? look, you know what? Truthfully, what I I don't know what really would it looks like. I really huh. don't know because the Bible only gives us little glimpses of these watchers, right? Yeah. And it doesn't, you know. So I'll admit that I I. This this is where I add the fantasy element. And I say, well, look, right. if the whole notion of sacrifice and atonement in religion and blood, um, you know, it, it, everyone has this. So even uh-huh. the pagan religions do. So there's some, again, there's some recognition of the need for blood atonement. Mm-hmm. And, and, and if, you know, if these demonic watchers are real, you know, and they are real, real beings, I think, well, you know, from, if I'm telling my fictional story, wouldn't it be interesting if they had them actually drinking the blood? Oh, sure. Um, why not? You know, I mean, uh, what, Cra- Does that happen in real life? I, I, not that I'm aware of, but, uh-huh. but it definitely communicates the truth that, uh, you know, they are drawing their spiritual sustenance, sustenance. from humans engaging in sacrifice. You know what I mean? So right. it's certainly spiritually true. Whether or not it's physically true, I, I don't know. I just thought of how. Um... You know the, that uh, you know Satan always tries to do a counterfeit uh, mm. worship of you know his 
entities and beings that he's created um you know like he he wants worship whether it's it's direct worship through satanism or you know paganistic worship he yeah. wants people to worship and idolize him either you know like i said through these, these uh these you know uh fallen angels watchers nephilim whatever they are um so he you know i i believe that with you know a lot of the pagan religions where they're sacrificing something whether it's a human or an animal or what have you yeah. it's a counterfeit of of the yes. one sacrifice that that the son of god and god incarnate jesus christ had done for all mankind past present and future for, for all those who would believe on him um and so that so we don't need to obviously you know sacrifice animals or humans to get right with God because the blood atonement was already paid for yeah. by Jesus Christ. Yes, and look, I mean, look, I believe that Yahweh, the God of the Bible, is real, but yet in the Old Testament, when they performed sacrifices to him, he didn't drink the blood. He didn't, you know, right. obviously. So, it, in other words, it was the spiritual, the spiritual reality was what the physical uh, expression of atonement and blood sacrifice was about. Uh -huh. And so I think it's the same with pagans. If you're going to sacrifice to pagan gods, you are going to open yourself up to control of those demonic entities. However, whether or not they literally are drinking the blood, no, I, I'm, I do that as a as a sort of a creative way of communicating the spiritual reality. Let's put it that way. I, I thought it was great. I when I when I read that, I was like, whoa! I can, I could totally see that in my mind's yeah. eye. How suspenseful and sure riveting and and scary that is <laughs> so anyway okay great well thank you so much brian uh for telling me about uh your new book and, and uh your your recent books and and uh, i'm definitely looking forward to as well as your fans uh to your future books by the way i do i have read um and i know i mentioned this in my other interview with you that I had read um, Hollywood Worldviews, which was required reading at Liberty University in the Christian cinema class, and, oh, cool. and I really liked it. it. It's in my library. And then um, then a book that my sister-in-law, Lana, gave me uh, is Word Pictures and, and uh, Knowing God Through Story and Imagination. And I haven't read it yet, but I intend to. And uh, so I'm definitely looking forward to um, – the rest of the uh, books in the uh, Chronicles of the Watcher series, and and definitely looking forward to uh, a movie adaptation of the Dragon King. That it, it would be well, awesome. Well, we'll see about that. But <laughs> if I could just conclude by just uh, telling people that if you want to get more information, go to my website gadawa dot com. G O D A W A dot com. Everything's there. Information, cool videos cool artwork, free stuff. It's really, there's a lot of good stuff on the website. And you can sign up for my newsletter uh, where you can get special deals and discounts and inside scoops about all my upcoming novels and such. So um, that that's where I would just tell people to go. Awesome. Yes, definitely check out Godawa.com. G as in go, O as in orange, D as in dog, A, W as in water, A.com. Godawa.com. And you can see, like he said, cool artwork, all of his books and, and, uh, I checked it out and it's a, it's a great website and, and he's a very, as you could tell, a very talented uh, Renaissance man. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. And, and how do you say thank you in Polish? Dziękuję. Dziękuję. Well, dziękuję very much. And oh, by the way, I, I forgot to say um, the Thai word for God, uh, prachow, P-R-A-C-H-O-W. So prachow. Prachow, oh. bless you. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> and and uh, of course, Shangdi, bless you. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Oh, great. Well, have a wonderful evening, Brian. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to my fascinating interview with Brian Gadawa. If you want to get to know Shang Di, which is the Chinese word for God that Brian describes in his book, The Dragon King, all you have to do is ask Jesus into your heart as your Lord and Savior. The Bible says that there is nobody righteous and all the things we do to try to please God, apart from the shed work of Jesus Christ on the cross, is vain and fruitless. Jesus said that he is the vine and we are the branches, and apart from him, we cannot bear fruit. Jesus Christ said he is the only way, truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Heavenly Father except through him. He is the door, my friends. Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, Islam, and relying on your own good works to please God can't save you, unfortunately. Only Jesus Christ, who is God and the Son of God, 
paid the ultimate sacrifice and penalty that our sins deserve. The great news is that you can become a new creation today, friends, by simply calling on Him and repenting of your sins. The Bible says that if you believe in your heart, God raised Jesus from the dead, and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, you shall be saved. A great website that lays God's simple plan of salvation that goes into detail, yet it's very easy to read, is fourlaws.com. Again, that's four, that's the number four, L as in Larry, A as in Apple, W as in water, S as in Sam, dot com. If you have any questions, want to provide feedback, or a topic idea, or need prayer of any kind, please email me at tigirlforgod at yahoo.com. As always, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you're at in the world.